Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. Oh, that was more aggressive than I thought it would come out, but welcome back to the channel. This is part three of our little wiring video series. In this video, we're going to pretty much finish up a lot of the truck wiring, get everything kind of done and start putting things back together. It's gonna be a good time, so stick around. So one of the hardest parts about trying to do things right when it comes to your electrical is finding the parts you need. So there's a couple of different ways you could go about doing what I'm doing here and using this body connector. The way that I have chosen, you know, none of them are necessarily wrong. You know, just choose what you feel comfortable with. It's your vehicle unless you own a shop, then it's not your vehicle. But in most cases, you know, you're working on your own vehicle, you're gonna be the one that's gonna have to fix it if it breaks. So choose a method that you feel comfortable with. And for me, I wanted to get the terminals, the correct terminals for this plug and crimp them onto my wires. Another option would be to go to the junkyard and get yourself some pigtails like this and then attach your wire to this pigtail. In my opinion, the less splices, the better. If you can have a continuous wire straight to your connector, there's gonna be a lot less chance of something bad happening. One less connection point to fail. And you know, like nothing's ever easy. Did some research, found out that these are called wedge lock connectors. That's all you can really find on them. They make a couple of different size pins. The ones that are in here are the 0 0.110 diameter. So I found, you know, some online. So I ordered these on eBay. This was a 50 pack for uh, 20 to 18 gauge wire. Showed up, looked great. I ordered these like months ago, like well before I even started the wiring. And I also ordered a pack of these. These are the uh, female end or the socket side. When, when wiring, you know, the, the male side is the pin, the female end is the socket. My socket's upstairs and we're not gonna talk about my pin. So I got this connector here all done. This is the end that we needed the pins for. I got most of my wires in there. I went to start working on the back connector. I popped these suckers open, but it says right on here, 20 to 18 gauge wire, just like the other pins. That's why I ordered them. You probably won't be able to even see it on video, but but there is no way that that is for an 18 to 20 gauge wire. I mean, you could fit a 10 in there. So I quickly realized that those were wrong. So I went on eBay and ordered some from a different seller and they showed up and they're the same exact stupid thing from the same company, Aveco products a different box they came in different boxes but they were the exact same pin completely wrong i wrote the company haven't heard back i'm now into these like 50 dollars i can't even use them my crimpers don't even go that big they just they're so brittle too they break instead of crimping so so that was getting kind of frustrating i went over to the ford dealership and uh, their best answer for me on pins was uh, go to the junkyard and grab a connector. And, you know, like I said, I didn't, that's not what I'm going for here. So I did end up finding the correct pins. I ordered a bunch today and this is what my guy sent over. I told him I needed 25 and he sent me five five packs. So these are the correct pins for those following along at home. These are the handy pack HP 7270s. They are the correct wire size, correct terminal size, everything. And then I also got some of these connectors here. This is the handy pack HP 7300. These are for my brake switch. I told him I only needed one three pack of these and he sent me five three packs. So whatever. They're actually pretty cheap. I paid less for all of these than I paid for one of. But you know, there's a lot of different styles of connectors too. You got Deutsch, you got Metropac, you got the uh, Delphi, you know, and sometimes, you know, you need the connector end. You don't need the pins. You're looking for the actual connector so you can plug in your shift modulator. And those can be hard to find too. So. Huh, now I see where your daughter gets it from. So anyways, now we can continue working on our wiring here and getting this body connector all wired up. We're making a lot of great progress here on the dash side of things. As you can see, we got a few things buttoned up here and taped up, eliminated all of these wires that went to these unneeded modules here. We integrated the uh, brake controller right into our harness, except for the ground. I don't know why I didn't add the ground in and tie it into these one of these many grounds that aren't needed anymore. Sometimes, you know, you just get ahead of yourself and you don't think about those things. Yeah. I also ordered a new connector for my ignition so that's what that is and like i was saying with these pins you know they're hard to find even when you order like a connector like that they don't come with like the pins for you most of the time they come with uh, pigtails like that so you'd have to solder each of those or butt splice or whatever your preferred method of connecting two wires together but that's the old connector i broke it and i just pulled the pins out of the old one and put them in the new one rather than using these because mine wasn't burnt up you know but what kind of terminal is that anyways like who knows what that's called and what size it is but yeah we're gonna keep plugging away at this i have to add in a bunch of wires here going up to the dash and all of my buttons and once again 
touching on uh, finding a wiring method that works for you. Not super proud of this, but I had a lot of this going on in the old wiring, and you know what? I never had one of these fail. Oh, honestly, I have no issue using these. They're quick, easy, and when they're done right, they work really well. Problem is a lot of people use the incorrect crimpers for these. Take a look at your crimpers, and most of the time, okay, make a liar out of me. But anyways, usually they stay right on them, insulated, not insulated. And the insulated ones will be kind of rounded like that. And they just kind of gently hug the connector, squeeze it tight. Your non-insulated crimps are going to look more like that there. Where they have a thing in the middle that kind of turns it into a U-shape. If you use these on those heat shrink butt splices, they pierce the insulation. And sometimes you can get it hot enough and melt that glue into the broken part. And it might be all right. But like I said, I use these everywhere and I didn't have a single issue with them. If you ask five different guys how to hook two wires together you'll get six answers so you'll be happy to know though this time around i'm using heat shrink solder and uh, some hot glue because i'm too poor to afford the heat shrink tube with the glue in it awesome progress is being made wouldn't you say all right guys so i've been plugging away at this wiring as you can tell we got a lot of stuff back together but waiting on the transmission controller to show up i didn't really want to like finish this whole thing off you know because i'm gonna have to obviously run more wires in here but you know it is what it is I guess this way it'll kind of keep truck wiring and the transmission wiring separate, I guess. We pretty much have everything over here done. We have the body connector all done, and I use every single spot in this connector except for one because I broke a tab. Kind of wish I had put in a bigger one now because I had a couple of like square ones left over from the Louisville. Whatever, this will work. Uh, I discovered through another YouTube video, I found these awesome heat shrink printable labels for your label makers. You know, I can print out whatever label I want and then put it on there and shrink it down. And I kind of like that. So now all my wires are labeled. Throttle, it probably says something else up here, but throttle it gives me the ECM pin number. And then that's the body connector pin number here. So I know where it goes if it would ever come, come out. These pins here, for whatever reason, I could not get them to stay on the wire. I tried crimping them like different ways, different sizes, and I don't know if it was just like the inside of the crimpy bit was just so smooth. Like, I mean, you had to pull on them a little bit to get them to come off, but I had a couple of them that came out as I was trying to get them in the connector. So I ended up going back through, pulling every single one of them out, putting a little dab of solder on the end of it so it's making a good connection here because I don't want to have bad connection anywhere, but especially not there. But that's wired in, and then we got a couple of drops coming down here this is for our brake pedal sensor so one of these is battery positive coming from your fuse box it's constant hot the other one comes from the switch and it does your brake light and it also tells the ECM when you touch the brake and then the other one we have a ground wire and then this goes to the ECM one of these is a normally open switch and one is a normally closed. So when you push the pedal, it opens the ground and applies hot. Like I said, I don't know which one my ECM uses, so I just ran both of them just so I'd be safe. And then if I ever figure out which one it does use, I have an extra set of wires in here somewhere. But these are our two data link wires. And then this is our data link connector here. So I gotta take out some of the old wires. These, it's a nine pin connector. You have battery positive ground, and then you have your 1939 and your 1587 that tie into there. And then your shield wire, I think goes in there somewhere. Yeah. And then somewhere we have to put our end of line resistor. This goes to our ignition switch. I'm not sure if I'm gonna use this or not. This was where the factory neutral safety switch was. It used to pass through the clutch, which that was kind of an interesting system. I think I kind of talked, I, I figured it out on video. You can see like my eyes laid up and I was like, oh, that's what that does. But it was kind of interesting, right? So the start circuit goes through the clutch switch, right? So you have to have the clutch push and that connects through that clutch switch for the start circuit. But it also had a green wire coming off of it, which went to the brake circuit. And I think what I figured out was it was for the cruise control. I know that. But I was like, how does this work? You know, because when you push the brakes, it applies power. But when you're not pushing the brakes, there's nothing on that circuit. So how does it know when you push the clutch in? And the only thing I can figure is that the uh, cruise control module can see the brake lights, right? So that would be when the clutch is up, it can see the brake lights because you know they have a, a certain ohm load right so when you push the clutch it opens that and just there's nothing there so it knows that you push the clutch and likewise when you hit the brakes if you're not pushing the clutch in and you hit the brake it's going to send 12 volts to the cruise control module and kick the cruise off that way at least that's how i think it works it's kind of crazy this is a 91 and the amount of technology that was in it because i if anyone's ever had the steering wheel off of these you'll know you got all these buttons on your steering wheel right all your cruise control on off and then you also have your horn all of this is done with one wire this is your horn relay here so it gets power 
from the fuse box, right? The ground for the this relay comes from your horn switch, but that horn ground for that relay and the horn switch also ties through your, your cruise control module, and each of those buttons has a different resistance value. So when you push the button, the computer can see all these different resistance values, and that's how it knew what to do. At least that's what I think, because it was all on one wire, which was crazy to me, considering it's a 91, you know? We didn't even have Windows 95 yet. Well, let's continue on here. So I don't know if I'm gonna use this. I might just make a jumper plug that'll plug into that because of, you know, when I made all this up, I didn't know how the TCM worked with the neutral switch and stuff. Yeah, no big deal there. We'll put a jumper on that, but this is your ignition plug i ended up replacing that because it was broken and then this here is all your this goes to your multifunction switch which is your turn signals it does all your tail lights that kind of stuff and this is for my cat throttle pedal so it's a three wire sensor you basically have a ground eight volt and then a sensor return wire and that's that and then we also have all of our gauge wires going up here and then we have down here we have warning lights and then uh, push buttons got a couple of spares here so the dash is just about done when it comes to like the truck wiring and I wanted to take a minute and talk about circuits and resistors. I'm going to take a seat because this might get lengthy. To start out, we're going to talk about the three different types of circuits. You have, first of all, parallel. Most circuits are a parallel circuit, which means you have a hot and a ground run to each device, right? In a 12 volt system, if you have like multiple batteries, they're wired in parallel, right? Positive to positive to positive, negative to negative to negative. And the same goes for other devices like light bulbs. So when you have an incandescent light bulb, you, know, you got positive on one side, negative on the other side, and you got the filament that bridges it. The other two types of circuits are series and complex. A series circuit, you can basically take like one light bulb and you go from your negative into the negative side, then out your positive side to the negative of the next one, and then out the positive side to the positive side of the battery. And that electricity will flow through the first light bulb, through the second light bulb, back to ground. Same thing goes with like batteries. If you wanted a 24 volt system, you got the positive on one, you go from the negative to the positive on the next battery to the negative, and then you'd have 24 volts across the negative of this battery, the negative of this battery, and the positive on this battery. I'll probably cut all this because it won't make any sense once I'm done. Christmas lights. Christmas lights are a complex circuit, right? So you have all these little tiny stupid bulbs, and if one bulb goes out, part of the strand goes out right so there's like three parallel circuits of series light bulbs and that's why that works you know you take one light bulb out you break in that circuit they all go out now why am i explaining this to you well sometimes that can kind of screw with you when you're working on a vehicle when you're using your multimeter or when you're hooking things up sometimes you know you're trying to ohm out a wire and you may not know this but you're going through a light bulb, you know, and you think you're on ground, but you're actually on a positive. So the best way to test stuff, you know, like wires is to disconnect everything on both ends. And one of the issues that I had was with my wait to start light. Essentially what was happening is, or what was happening was, this is the solenoid for your grid heater. All right, so it gets power from the battery and when this coil energizes, the uh, it sends power to your grid heater. So this solenoid gets constant power from the battery and then the ECM switches the ground. So you have constant 12 volts going to one side of this. So the way the indicator lamp works on this, and you can actually wire a separate output. You can have one of the other outputs on the ECM programmed to do your wait to start light and your fast idle light. But mine was already set up. It's just got a plug that taps off of the positive and negative for the solenoid. And then that runs back through my body connector here and inside. And the issue that I was having is because that has constant power, it was going back and going through this light bulb. And the other side of this light bulb is hooked to the um, hot and run circuit which has other devices on it. So basically it was putting that coil and this light bulb in series and this light bulb was lit all the time. And I don't think it was enough current to close the uh, solenoid and turn on the grid heater because it was like this for like a day. The grid here still works. And typically something like that would burn up the grid heater, but it was just, you know, one of those things, the light was constantly on. And as soon as you turn the key on and it actually activated the um, grid heater, man, I cannot think today. The light would get brighter and then it would get dim again. So to fix that, I added in a diode. And if you don't know what a diode is, I had some here to show you. But anyways, a diode is usually, it's like a black round little cylindrical thing. It's got a silver line on one end. And it's essentially, it's just a check valve. It's a one-way valve for electricity. It's kind of like a LED light emitting diode. You know, you can only hook them up one way. It's the same aspect, you can only, if you were to wire a bunch of LEDs in series and you add one backwards, they wouldn't work because it only allows current to flow one way. So I just added a diode into this circuit so that it couldn't do that. And that fixed my issue with that light being on. And I know I used light bulbs as an example, but like relays can do the same thing when you're testing circuits and that kind of stuff because they have a coil in them. And usually one side is hooked to 
hot or ground. Just be aware of that as you're testing things and ohming things out. When you touch these two leads together, it should give you a pretty close to zero. And when you're testing like ohming out a wire to figure out what goes to what, you should also have really close to zero. If you have a reading that's a little bit higher, you know, you might be reading through a light bulb or a relay or something, some other component. Sometimes you need a diode or a resistor. In fact, for the gauges, indicator lamps, the engine warning light and the engine check engine light, they are fed out of the cat ECM. So that's what tells those to come on and off. A lot of these ECMs, they have like a bulb check kind of built into them. So they'll send out like a little bit of voltage. I, I could be making this up, but Either way, even when the light is off, it's still stayed lit a little bit. Fix that with a resistor. The resistor just kind of helped eat up that bare voltage, I guess. But yeah, we made a ton of progress back here on this harness. We're just about ready to put the TCM in and get it back on the truck. We still have a few things. I ended up running a couple of spares for different things. And I don't even know what this is. Cargo lamps, question mark. I don't know. But that's looking good. Got a good start up here. I got my fuse and relay box mounted up here. Uh, I went ahead and got a terminal block to put in here or a distribution block. So I'll put, I'll run a big wire to the battery to this post. And then I have, I think I went overboard on that too, but I have a ton of ports here that I can tie off of for power for relays and fuses. I definitely should have gotten one with more fuses than relays. Uh, this is for my cooling fan. It requires two relays. The way the cooling fan circuit works on these engines, because originally they were driven by compressed air they had a you know a mechanical fan and it used compressed air to uh, activate and deactivate the fan it's actually backwards from what you think it is so the ECM has an output for the cooling fans it is pin 11 on my ECM uh, it's a 12 volt output however it sends 12 volts out to turn the fans off because it needed air pressure to shut the fan off so it would send power to a solenoid that should send air to the fan which would deactivate it. We want the opposite. We want to be able to, when that sends power, turn the fans on. And I had this hooked up backwards originally. So basically my fans ran constantly until it got hot enough and then they'd shut off. So what I did is I went two relays. One is an engine running output. So as soon as the engine starts, this relay will close and send power to the second one because the first one is set up as normally open. Once that has power, it'll close and send power to the second relay, which I have set up as normally closed. So when this gets power, it opens. I did it this way because I don't, you know, when you're sitting there waiting for the grid heater to cycle, you don't want your fans running because that's a pretty big draw, you know, or if you're just sitting there with the key on, you know, doing whatever, you don't need the fans running that whole time. So the run engine running output will help take care of that. Hopefully if I can get that programmed, I did it differently last time. I ended up using three, re three relays last time and I used what did I use? So I used three relays last time. I had the ECM going to a normally closed one. And then after that, it went to a normally open 12 volt ignition source. So that one would close when you turn the key on. And then after that, it went to a normally closed relay that was controlled by the grid heater ground. So when you turn the key on, if the grid heater was on, the fans wouldn't run. This will be a little better because we now have two relays instead of three. I like this little uh, relay box here. It's kind of nice. Originally, I picked up a Saab relay box. I don't I think I tossed it maybe. I went to the junkyard and pulled it out of a Saab because it was the only one that had normally open and normally closed relays in it that I could find in the junkyard. But it just wasn't going to fit nicely. And this was a lot more nicer because this comes with all the pins and, you know, rubber things. And so yeah, things are moving along nicely. Yeah, we're going to get back to work here. All right, so that's gonna be it for this video. Uh, we have a lot of the wiring kind of done. We're starting to see the finish line. We can start putting some things back together, doing a smoke check when we hook the battery up and uh, hopefully things just kind of work. It's really only two options. They work or they don't, or they go up in smoke. Uh, thank you guys for watching. In the next video, like number four or whatever, we'll get into the transmission wiring and the transmission controller and all that fun stuff. So stick around for that video. If you guys like the video, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. Uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome to the channel. My name is Drew. This project we're working on is called Alley Cat. Kind of weird to do the introductions at the end of the video, but better late than never, I guess. Also, if you're new to the channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever they put it. Thank you guys for all your support. I enjoy reading your comments and your thoughts on how I did things and what I could have done better. And uh, we'll see you in the next video. Bye.